before. Okay, so thank you so much um, again for the information uh, and for the introduction, Emily. I'm gonna jump right in because we used up a few of our minutes there. Um, so um, this is Bobcats in Tucson, a study of Bobcats along the urban wildland interfaces. And uh, I am Cheryl Mollahan. This is a wonderful group of people that have come together. Um, we are working with the Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center, which is up in Scottsdale, and they are our 501C umbrella. We were able to get a grant from the Game and Fish Department Heritage Fund, which is the Lottery Dollars for Wildlife Fund. And um, that was essentially to pay for equipment. Uh, we have a very diverse team uh, here in Tucson. There are four of us who are retired uh, wildlife biologists. All of us worked for Arizona Game and Fish and other places. We have two veterinarians who are volunteers from the Arizona Exotic Animal Hospital, and they help us uh, with uh, a mobilization when we put our radio collars on. We have a wonderful GIS person, um, Robert Davis, and you will see some of his maps. And then Susie Prangy is our statistician, and Gail Sherman is our photographer, and you'll see lots of her photographs, as well as others that people have sent in. So I always like to start, um, before I jump into bobcats, to talk about cats a little bit, because one of the neat things about working on cats and one of the neat things about talking uh, about cats is that we all already know a lot because we live with cats on a daily basis. Um, so just a little broader perspective for you. First of all, most highly evolved of the meat eater. So this is from the standpoint of adaptations uh, and the cheetah which is this one is actually um, the highest as far as those really um, specialized adaptations for a particular lifestyle. In all cases with cats, it has to do um, with their ability to catch their own prey. They are obligate carnivores, which means that they typically eat what they catch. So they're not scavengers. Um, there are some situations especially in the Eastern United States with bobcats, where if there is a fresh carcass, um, say a deer carcass or something that they may scavenge. But day in, day out, they catch what they eat and most of their adaptations have to do with that ability to capture prey. So I think everyone knows about the eyesight. We tend to not think about um, how well developed their other uh, senses are, their sense of hearing and their sense of smell, equally well developed uh, as their eyesight, and they do use all of those. And of course, we all know about the incredible athleticism um, videos that we're getting into Bobcats in Tucson just reinforces some of that. They are remarkably well adapted uh, to live in the environment that we share with them. So I mentioned already the fact that we all have a connection and many of us live with cats every day. I'm sure some of you have some on your computer. I'm hoping mine will stay away this morning for a little bit longer. Um, one of the things that I like everyone to take home with them from this is truly a cat is a cat is a cat. So all members of the cat family are remarkably similar in their adaptations. And that includes the one that many of us live with every day um, the domestic house cat. This is Stanley. He's one of mine. Um, so as we go along and as we talk about bobcats in particular and also other wild cats here in Arizona, um, just pay attention to some of those things that you see behavior-wise from your own cat because all of those adaptations are in evidence. Okay, so I have to start uh, by talking about intelligence because this is a much deliberated, argued um, point of contention among cat people and people who aren't so fond of cats. Um, the scientific truth is that all cats have large, well-developed brains. It is a scientific fact. They are very intelligent. That said, how they use their intelligence uh, sometimes is a little different than uh, dogs, for instance. So you can train a cat to do anything at once. And the best example I have of this, if you think of the circus and all the things the dogs do, the bears are uh, playing basketball, riding bicycle, and what are the cats doing? The cats are growling and maybe you can get them to jump through a ring of fire, but they don't look a bit happy about it. 
Um, <clears throat> The other one is, and this is one of my favorites, I had a coffee mug with it forever. Cats know exactly how you feel. They don't give a damn, but they know. And then from one of my favorite authors, Robert Heinlein, women and cats will do as they please and men and dogs should relax and get used to the idea. The other thing about cats that rubs people the wrong way sometimes is the attitude. And I would say, uh, you know, at the very least, a very arrogant attitude. They own their space, and that is very much in evidence with our uh, urban bobcat population. Um, and and I think I suspect kind of a, a little bit of an elitist view of the rest of the world as well. So thousands of years ago, cats were worshipped as gods. Cats have never forgotten this. I love this one. Dogs have owners, and cats have staff. And attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. And I had this cat, his name was Bob of the Serengeti and he looked like this, but he acted like this. Okay, so let's talk about some of the adaptations. First of all, uh, I mentioned most of these go back to the fact that they are predators day in, day out. Uh, they capture and kill their own food. Um, they have huge paws. This is uh, a bobcat from a bobcat study that I worked on in Ohio, and he was one of our males. He weighed about 25 pounds. If you look at that foot compared to my hand, so he weighed 25 pounds and I weigh 170 pounds, but his foot is as big as my hand. They use those large feet to grasp and hold on to prey. They don't kill with their feet. They simply use them, and you can see this is a Canada lynx here, and he's reaching out and he's gonna grab that snowshoe hair, and then they um, actually kill with their teeth, but those big paws are very important. So a very short face, um, and, and so we often don't talk about that, but if you think of this in comparison to the dog family, as we go along, the adaptations that cats have made versus the adaptations that dogs have made um, very much have to do with how they make their living day in and day out. So a very short face, big broad nose, um, and amazingly strong jaw muscles. That's what these are. Allow them to open his mouth very far because of the short face and tremendous amount of pressure. Um, in the force of the bite, it's remarkable. So these are the canine teeth. We call these the killing teeth. And these are what he actually day in, day out captures his prey with. So the way that cats kill, they hold on and then they use the canine teeth. They fit uh, something like a mountain lion and a mule deer, for instance, uh, almost fit together like a key fitting a lock. And then what he does is um, he feels there are a lot of nerves. And once that slips into that notch, he bites down, hopefully breaking the spinal cord or at the very least paralyzing the animal. Uh, this picture, I don't use very many pictures from the internet, but I found this one amazing. Uh, this guy did the greatest job ever. He went on, I think he said 200 safaris to get this picture, but this is a tiger, of course, and tigers are the largest. Um, 700 pounds, which is large pony, small horse size, amazing. Um, and you can see he's doing exactly what we just talked about. He's grasping with those enormous paws and claws and he'll bite down uh, here on the spine and um, effectively paralyze or uh, kill the animal. All right, so let's talk about bobcats a little bit. Um, they are in the lynx genus, lynx rufus, and there are four species in this genus uh, of cats. They all uh, are remarkably similar in how they look. They're very extreme. The legs are very long. Um, the feet are huge, the short tail. Um, they all have the ear spots. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, it's unusual for a group of animals to be dependent on one particular prey source. But in the case of the lynx genus, all four species at some level uh, are dependent upon rabbits and hares as their primary prey. And bobcats are actually the least dependent. If you look at something like 
Um, the Canada lynx, which is our other North American species, they take the place of bobcats when you get into the boreal forest. And then the Iberian lynx uh, in uh, Europe and the European lynx. And uh, by and large, rabbits are their first choice if they have that opportunity. Okay, so bobcats, and one of the things you'll, I hope you take away from this because it still consider, continues to amaze me is that they are a remarkably flexible animal and that flexibility transfers to their prey base. Um, because they eat more than just, but they have been able to occupy a much wider variety of habitats. And in fact, here in the lower 48, there were bobcats in every state, pretty much north to south, east to west, and then down into Mexico. Um, sorry, I have a cat, please. <laughs> and down into Mexico. And in fact, the picture I showed you of uh, the bobcat in Ohio, that particular population was reoccupying after 150 year absence. So this was a very widespread carnivore, but that range was greatly reduced. Um, so they are sit and wait, stealth and camouflage predators. They are amazingly able to hide themselves. People say to me, I'm out all the time and I've never seen a bobcat. And I say, a bobcat has seen you. I guarantee you, they just simply have the ability to avoid us. They blend into their environment uh, in an incredible way. And they also behaviorally utilize the stealth, the camouflage, um, all of those things come into play. This is a uh, sequence um, that a photographer sent me. And you can see this, this is a bobcat over at um, Sweetwater Park. And He's watching, sitting, watching, and he starts to pounce. This all happens very quickly. And if all goes well, he comes out with a very satisfied smirk on his face and a nice fat cotton rat. Now, John told me that he watched him catch three in a very short period of time. So they're very, very good at what they do. All right, so let's talk a little bit, bit about the diet. I mentioned rabbits already, and of course, everyone knows in, in the desert, Sonoran Desert, we have cottontails, we have uh, a couple species of jackrabbits. Those are all very important um, to bobcats. We also have a tremendous abundance and uh, density of rodents, and that's another important um, part of the bobcat diet. One of the questions that um, we're asking is, what do Tucson bobcats eat? What do bobcats who live in urban environments eat um, that's different than what we see from bobcats who don't have uh, an opportunity to hunt in urban areas? And most definitely rodents or rabbits are still really important, but they do have mothers. We've gotten lots of pictures of bobcats hunting at bird feeders. If you think about what you do with a bird feeder, you're going to gather the animals, birds and other animals, and um, that is going to attract predators. So we have seen them hunting at bird feeders. Um, they, again, are flexible. And this is a, a cat at the Sweetwater wetlands. And you can see she caught a coot. Now, most of our desert bobcats don't come in contact on a regular basis with waterfowl, but she will certainly take advantage of it. And then finally, other species that live with us, so things like wood rats, for instance, that sometimes we have higher densities in urban environments than we do um, in wildlands environments. So they're very good at taking advantage of what's available. One of the biggest questions that we have that we'll try to answer with this study is do Tucson bobcats prey on pets or domestic livestock? Um, and this is an important question because much of the fear and concern about living with bobcats um, for people comes from this, a fear that they're going to kill their dog, their cat, their chickens, their goats, um, all of those things. And so we're especially interested in the question. Uh, after we started, uh, a person in Tucson sent me this photograph. 
This was a female. She actually had three big kittens with her. There's one kitten over here and there's two kittens off of camera. And you can see they're very focused on those nice big white, really good smelling, noisy chickens that seem to stay put in one place. And they will work very hard to get into the coop. They won't smash it. They won't do any of those things like a bear might, for instance. But if they can find a way in, um, they're going to do that. And she, she said that they were you know, there for a few hours. Uh, they didn't get the chicken, so she had built a good coop. But um, definitely, they do not perceive the difference between something that we consider uh, belonging to us, so to speak. It's just part of their environment. So one of the things that we're doing as part of this project, because this is equally a project about people, as well as a project um, about bobcats, is we are surveying people in Tucson about their attitudes towards living with bobcats. And if you go to our website, bobcatsintucson.net, um, there is a place that you can, it says we would love your input, click on that. It's about a four minute survey. Um, we have over 800 responses already. We started in November, so we're thrilled with that. Um, but we'd really like to hear from people who live in Tucson about how they feel about living with bobcats. We'd appreciate it if you can do that. Take a few minutes uh, for us to do that. Um, what type of hab habitats do Tucson bobcats prefer? Wildlands, one of the wonderful things about living in Tucson is that we have interspersed open areas and uh, wildlands surrounding us. Um, altered but open, so we particularly wanted to include a golf course because some of the uh, long-standing work that's been done on bobcats uh, here in, uh, on urban bobcats was done in Kiowa Island, South Carolina. So if you're a golf fan, the PGA was there a couple of weeks ago. And an urban mix. And when we talk about urban mix, this goes everything from very dispersed one house every four or five acres to very, very dense housing. And we really wanted to cover uh, all of those options. And so we worked very hard on um, picking a study area that let us do that. So our approach to this is to let video colored bobcats show us where they choose to hunt, to rest, to birth, and raise kittens in Tucson. So we very specifically chose our study area to provide, we hoped each one of our bobcats would have that choice of environment. So everything from wildlands, um, this is Saguaro National Park, Tucson Mountain Park, and you can see uh, this is Sweetwater Preserve, um, Felix Paseo Park, um, this is the Painted Hills. So a lot of parkland uh, owned by or managed by a variety of agencies and as well as um, urban areas. So the west side and then over here we have some um, larger tracks, some smaller tracks, and then those are interspersed uh, with urban areas. So this is the county lands that you're looking at here, but all of this are neighborhoods. So this is Trails End, this is Gates Pass, if you're familiar with that. Um, so uh, that was how we picked our study area. Now, point about the study area, it's just where we capture bobcats. All of Tucson is our study area. So we're collecting data from all of Tucson. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so we're capturing bobcats specifically along that wildlands urban interface in West Tucson and fitting them with radio collars. Um, these are very sophisticated. They're GPS and satellite based. They have two way communication. I can talk to them. I can send them an email. They send me information. Um, I can program them to collect two to four very accurate GPS locations a day and then transmit that to us every one to four days. So the more locations and the more often that I get that data, um, the shorter amount of time that my battery will last. So it's just a trade-off that we make. And then this is also a mortality study which means if the collar does not move, assuming it's still on the animal, if the animal does not move for four hours, 
I get a, a, a message that says, you've got a mortality, the animal's not moving, and then we can go out and assess that particular situation. And a really key point, because this was, and, and it's something that we worry about a lot, um, is that it's, we actually have three ways to drop a collar off of an animal. It has a, a date uh, based on its programming of when it will automatically fall off. And that's from 16 months for the females up to about two years for the males. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more in a little bit about what we're getting from our females. And then it also has, uh, I can send that command. So say for instance, we have a bobcat who just decides to uh, disperse to a different area. I can give that command and take that collar off. And it will also come off if it perceives um, what it considers to be a lethal uh, error. So far, so good on that. Okay, so how do you catch a bobcat? Well, um, this is a drop gate trap. There is a treadle right here. Uh, these sticks are to encourage him to step on the back of the treadle, which will drop the trap door. And um, in the back, there's a little fuzzy mouse, uh, believe it or not. There is uh, some roadkill uh, rabbit in most cases that we pick up roadkills all year, so don't look in our freezer. And then there's also some uh, commercial bobcat lure and usually some bobcat poop and some urine. Well, we give him a smorgasbord, so to speak. All you're trying to do is get him to walk in the door. And I think everyone knows how curious cats are, and that's what we take advantage of. We also put something outside, something shiny, flashy, uh, something that moves in the wind to get him to come look. And the idea is he'll step on the treadle and the gate will drop. This is one of the more unusual um, baits that we used this year. We were a little low on finding rogue kills. And so this is a stuffed jackrabbit, obviously toy. And we set it one night and lo and behold, the next morning we had a bobcat um, whose name is Bunny. <laughs> so uh, forever, but if all goes well and um, we've done a good enough job of convincing them when they come in the morning to check our traps, we have a very unhappy, disgusted Bobcat who's not the least bit happy with uh, wildlife research at this particular moment in time. Uh, this is our veterinarian. Uh, Dr. Erica Johnson, and she's injecting him. This is Rondé back here, who's our capture specialist. So we inject him with a cocktail of drugs, um, go to sleep in just a few minutes. And then we have somewhere around 45 minutes to an hour before they start to um, perceive us, which is when we want to not be handling them anymore. Try to Reduce the stress every way we can. Um, it's no different than when you uh, are uh, anesthetized. It's a stressful situation. When we've got him, we do as much as we can. We take blood. The Game and Fish Department will check for diseases. Um, bobcats have, in most cases, can contract domestic cat diseases. So they'll check for that. We also take a DNA cheek swab, just like you give a cheek swab if you've ever done that. And um, some hair samples, the hair samples tell us what they've eaten since that hair came in, some pretty cool science there. And um, most importantly, oh, we take a weight. So this is Carrie Baldwin and Al Account and me and Dr. Johnson. So that's all our team. The weight's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it gives us an idea along with the wear on the teeth of how old the bobcat might be as far as adult or juvenile. We only radio collar adults. And then finally, we attach the radio collar. So this is the mechanism here to allow it to fall off. Basically with that command, it pulls apart and then the collar just falls off. The collars um, are as lightweight as we can possibly make them. Uh, we try to stay under 5% of the body weight uh, of the animal. And then once we're finished, uh, we put him back in his trap uh, this was a cold morning, which is why he's sitting out in the sun. And then we wait until he's completely recovered. And then we release him. And he just wants to get away. He's not a bit happy with the whole experience. This is the same Bobcat. This is Bobcat Sweetwater. 
Uh, if you saw the um, article uh, in the Sunday newspaper, that was this bobcat. He's one of our young males. And this is him a few weeks later at a water source. And I love this picture. Like he posed uh, early in someone's roses. Okay, so what have we learned today? Well, first of all, we've caught 16. We started in November. And of those 16, we have nine radio callers and they're all out. Um, we have five adult females and four adult males. <clears throat> Our hope is to add 12 more callers this fall. So you say, why do you pick 12? Well, the goal is to have a radio caller on all of the females on our study area. Uh, some males as well, but we get much more information from females. So if you look at our area, this is a female. This female lives over on Tumamoc Hill. This is a female. This is a female. This is a female out here. And this plum color was a female. So if we look at our study area, you can see that we have some areas, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is all male activity here. This is Sweetwater. Um, this is the female, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, likely 11 or 12 open home ranges. Doesn't mean there isn't a bobcat there. It just means we didn't catch it. So that's the goal for this fall is to um, have all of our females radio collar. And the study continues through 2023. So we're in the first year. Um, what have they showed us so far? Well, and I have to tell you, after working on bobcats in Ohio, I am amazed at the places they go. They use the wildlands habitat, but they extensively use the urban areas, especially our females. This is Bobcat Minnie, and she lives on the Star Pass Golf Resort. Um, this is a female that lives on one side uh, of Gates Pass, and then we have another female on the other side of Gates Pass. You can see how they bump up against each other, and this female lives out uh, west of Sweetwater. So, if you look at this from the standpoint of building densities, uh, everything from parklands, which have no building densities, wildlands, just some incredibly dense areas. Uh, the two cats that lived on Tumamoc, um, you can see they cross uh, out into some pretty high um, populated, densely populated areas, and the same over here. So they by no means, you know, live in the wildlands and come hunt in Tucson, they live here. Um, they live here as much as we do. So what else have we learned? Well, first of all, the home ranges are small. Okay, so this female that lives on the golf course, her home range is in a mile, less than a square mile. Our other females are between two and three square miles. And that's pretty small for a bobcat. Uh, and the fact that they can successfully make their living in that small of an area is a suggestion that it's pretty high quality habitat for them. Um, the female home ranges do not overlap. You can see this tiny little bit of overlap here. Um, that is because, uh, and that's normal for bobcats. That's what you wanna see. That's a normal um, population structure for bobcats that the females do not overlap. The males overlap extensively. So with the exception of this plum color here, all of these other locations are males. Those are three males that you can see overlap with each other and then also with females. This is uh, one of our males. You can see the overlap there. This is another one. So typically the males will overlap with several females. So one thing I wanna make sure and mention because this is such an important part of what we're doing is I told you that we had a capture area, which you see here, but our study area is all of Tucson. And all of these dots that you see are locations that people have provided us data on bobcats in Tucson. Um, it's pretty amazing. And this actually is due to be updated. We're up to almost 500 reports now that people have sent in. 
and we're gathering data on all of these reports as well as what our radio cats are showing us. So again, if you are lucky enough to have a neighborhood bobcat, um, you can go to bobcatsintucson.net and if you click on report a bobcat, it'll ask you to send your address. And if you have a picture, send a picture and just give us information. Um, we'll be back in touch with you depending on uh, what kind of uh, uh, observation you have. Which kind of brings us to the next important part of the project and we are literally knee deep in this right now. We're in the middle of kitten season, uh, our first kitten season. So we're learning a lot, um, a little bit about bobcat reproduction. First of all, bobcats are single moms, uh, most cats. Uh, the male does not help uh, with raising the young. She takes care of that completely herself. And one of the questions that we ask, which is surprising that we don't have an answer for this, is when are kittens born? And the reason that that's kind of confusing for people, so many animals are fairly synchronous in when uh, their young are born, think something like deer. In the case of bobcats, it appears that they do all try to reproduce in the spring. Um, our females had their kittens in April. And um, what happens is if she loses those kittens, she very quickly comes back into estrus and she rebreeds and she'll try another set of kittens. So somewhere 70 days or so later, she will have a second set of kittens. And I believe we have one of our females that's in that situation. If she loses those kittens, she'll keep trying. And so the conventional wisdom is for bobcats is that they can have kittens any month of the year. And that is actually true. There is a focal point time which we're in, but they will keep trying. Uh, to have kittens. The other question is where do they have them? Where do the females have and raise their kittens? So her selection of a den site to have her kittens is probably the most important decision that she makes. Um, bobcats do not have dens that they go back to every night. They, they will have favorite places, but they might visit once a month, but they do not go back to the same place over and over except for when they have kittens and then they select a den site and they keep those kittens there um, anywhere from 10 to about 14 weeks, uh, on average about 12 weeks. So bobcat kittens, again, you know domestic house cats, you've seen house cat kittens, bobcat kittens very similar in their development. Of course they're larger, but otherwise very similar in their development. So that first six weeks or so, they are completely vulnerable. She has to go hunt, she has to go find food. So she's gone a lot. And so she has to choose a place um, that they're going to be safe. And, and it comes back in most cases to very well hidden place. Uh, I did this work in Ohio and what we found there was uh, huge brush piles. These are left over from logging. Uh, they crawled into logs. I saw her back out of this log. Uh, and they used holes in trees. And I suspect our desert bobcats were probably cavity nesters at one time in riparian areas when we had uh, big gallery forests and lots of big gallery forests and big trees. Uh, unfortunately, in most cases, that's not available to them any longer. So where does an urban bobcat have her kittens? That was one of their, our main questions. So from her perspective to, a, to an urban mom, the flat roof on a house is like a rock pile. It gives her, it gives her an area, a space under a deck, may look like a brush pile. She's gonna pick a place where she feels safe and where she believes her kittens will be safe. I think that's the primary selection that happens. So this is a picture that was sent out into us from a homeowner of a female and kittens last year. Uh, these are all, Tucson bobcat pictures. Uh, I love the one nursing the kittens on the patio table. <laughs> this is actually one of our radio cats and her uh, kitten from last year, a house that she visits quite often. So I, and, and I, we looked at this video ahead of time and it was a little glitchy. So I will say, if you go to our website, there is an area for slideshows and videos and you can see this, but I mentioned already a cat is a cat is a cat. Well. Bobcat kittens are no different. A kitten is a kitten is a kitten. 
I personally think this is a quality of life issue to have in your backyard. They are bad. Okay, so where are we with our radio and females? Well, this has been an incredible learning experience for us because our five females spend probably 70% of their time in neighborhoods. Um, these are our one, two, three, four, five. Four of the five are denned with kittens. This female, I think may have lost kittens and rebred. We're trying to sort that out right now. But the other four are all done with kittens and they're at about eight weeks in. Um, they all had their kittens roughly the third week in April. Uh, so kittens are getting really big now. Um, and I mentioned they spend most of their time in neighborhoods. When they went to their, when they went to have kittens, they went to the highest, steepest, nastiest, cliffiest place in their home range. And that's where they had the kittens. So they are all urban females who found part of the wildland habitat. Remember, we wanted them to have access to both. And they really showed us something interesting. Even the golf course female uh, was able to uh, find a nice rocky place to have her kittens. Uh, so I'll show you a couple examples. This is Bobcat Morgan, and this is last year's kitten. And Morgan lives um, basically south of Gates Pass in that area, Inkled Road. Um, here's home range. So these are all of Morgan's uh, home range points to date. And you notice that they're fairly dispersed. There are a few little clusters, but the really big cluster is this right here. And that's her den site. She's at the very top of those Picos, um, Twin Buttes over by the Camino de Este Trailhead, if you're familiar with that area. and she had her kittens there in April. This is two weeks of movement data from Morgan. So what you see is out and back, out and back. So she's going out and hunting and coming back to the den site. And the kittens are old enough now that she's probably bringing food back because she'll wean them in about another month. So she has to get them over uh, onto um, solid food. Um, this is a picture, so this is Dos Picos, and these are all of her den locations for the last two months. What is interesting is she probably likely had the kittens here, has moved them once or twice to where you see these other really uh, dense locations, but they're all within about a hundred yard area uh, of where she's been. So what you're seeing with all these locations is her coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. Um, again, she spends the vast majority of her time pre-kittens out in a variety of different kinds of neighborhoods. Uh, this is Bobcat Margaret. Margaret lives on Tumamoc, and um, this was Margaret right before she had her kitties. You can see she's pretty saggy baggy pregnant there, uh, getting a drink of water from a homeowner uh, near the base of Tumamoc. And if you are one of the many people in Tucson that hiked to Mamak Hill, uh, I'm guessing Margaret's probably hiked it more than you have. Uh, these locations, again, the den activity. So here's the road that comes up and here's the observatory. She had her kittens on this very, very steep slope. And we assume in some rocks, we could not find them. We tried, we went to all four of our den sites and basically I think because they're in rocks the GPS locations were spread over an area they weren't in an exact location so she had her kittens here she moved them I think she's moved them twice um, this is again a very small area so she moved them maybe 100 yards they carry them in their mouths and she's still there so we're waiting to see uh, what happens when um, they move away from the den site sometime over the next few weeks when the kittens can travel with them. Okay, so obviously now the question for us is where do females that don't have access to such areas have their kittens? We specifically made it so that all of our females had this mixture of 
uh, wildlands and, and urban environments. And so what we'll be doing this year is we'll specifically be trying to trap on this side of our study area um, to collar some females who simply don't have access to those mountainous kinds of areas to see what kinds of places they select. Um, this is, uh, these are two pictures from a homeowner that we visited last weekend. And he had, or two weekends ago, he has had females with kittens at his house for the past five years. They pretty much just take over the backyard. While we were there, there was a female out, you know, you could look out the kitchen and window and see her. Um, they have a teenage son who was very nonchalant about the fact that he always had bab bobcats in his yard. Uh, I could have just moved in and stayed there. I thought it was amazing. Okay, so we believe that the apparently large and thriving population around Tucson be a point of pride for the Tucson community. This is unique. There have been, there are other urban populations of bobcats, but in most cases, um, they're around the edges. Uh, they don't come into the city like we see our bobcats doing and rarely have their kittens in an urban environment. And we obviously have a large population that do based on the number of reports um, that we're getting. And we think this is something Tucson should be proud of. If you look around the world, most spotted cats uh, are in trouble. Uh, we have an amazing resource in Arizona we have an amazing resource in Tucson. I think it's a quality of life thing to be able to watch a spotted cat raise her kittens. Um, we believe much of it has to do with long-term efforts in, in Tucson to set aside areas of wildlands and also to protect travelways. So they have to have a way to travel through those urban areas. Obviously roads are not a good thing, uh, especially busy roads. Our females, our, all of our bobcats cross busy roads on a regular basis. And we've had one mortality from that, by the way. Uh, we had a male that got killed up on Trails Inn. So um, the other thing, and I guess this is important to me, especially after going the last two weekends and looking at kitten homes, is that it also shows that peaceful coexistence between species is both possible and beneficial to both. If you are a cat person or you are a wildlife person, um, this, is, this is really cool stuff. Uh, and I think it's something that Tucson should be proud of. I think it's, uh, I think it's a remarkable situation. So our long goal, is not the first study. It's really to create an ongoing um, Bobcats in Tucson conservation program that lets us continue research, but also reaching out to people, you know, just raising awareness uh, and appreciation and also trying to, you know, mitigate conflicts because there are conflicts out there and try to help people who aren't as comfortable having Bobcats as part of their home environment. Um, I mentioned we got a grant for about $35,000 from the Game and Fish Department Heritage Fund. Uh, we're all volunteers. Uh, all of us who are capturing, radio calling, monitoring, uh, our veterinarians volunteer their time. Um, when we started putting this together, I'm very proud to say that no one said no. Everybody has got on board and a tremendous amount of expertise. Um, for me, it is a labor of love. I think it's a story that needs to be told, and uh, I'm a cat person. Uh, all direction donations go directly to purchase equipment. As I mentioned, we don't get paid. Uh, it's just to purchase our capture equipment, and primarily radio callers. They are expensive, $2,300 each for our callers. So we have nine. That's what we bought with our original grant, and we're in fundraising right now, and we hope to purchase 12 more. That's to fill in all of those gaps in our area. And then we'll also try and recapture our cats this fall, change their collars so that we can continue to gather data on these cats that we uh, know about. And then um, we'll put those collars back out in, Janu in January. So to date, we've raised 22,000 people, $22,000. 
people have been trying to donate. Uh, if you want to donate, you can just go to the website and it gets the, gives you the information. And I always have to end with a little perspective because I talked about these guys owning their space and, and so on and so forth. They really are fierce and wonderful little creatures, but you always have to keep things in perspective. This was a homeowner sent this in to us. He really wants to drink a water badly. <laughs> All right. All right, so thanks for your time and attention. Um, I obviously love talking to these guys. I'm happy to answer questions uh, and um, the best I can. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my screen share. All right, there we go. Great, well, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was really interesting. And we've had a Thank lot you. of really good questions and comments come in over the chat. Um, because I'm the host, I'm gonna take advantage of this moment and ask you the first question. And I just wondered if you could share, you know, one or a few things that individuals like us who live in the Tucson area could be doing. Of course, we could support the project and, and do the survey, but what are some actions that we could do around our own homes to make the habitat better for bobcats? Thank you. That's a great question, and it's it's one. So you know, I keep the, uh, I mentioned already that um, pets and domestic livestock are one of the places that we have seen conflict um, from people. And so you know, if you if you have a cat, have a catio. That's what we have. A way for them to get outside, but it's contained. It has a roof on it. Uh, bobcats can climb anything. So. As far as a fence goes, you need to have a roof. Um, even for your little dogs, uh, take them out on a leash or have some sort of a controlled environment that they can go out in. Uh, that's, that's a really important point. Um, if you have chickens, know that you are basically putting out a really nice, big, really good smelling lure for bobcats. And so again, um, one of the people I have talked to about this said, and he actually had one of our radio collar bobcats catch a couple of our chickens and he was totally cool with it. And he said, I just had to reinforce the chicken fort. So again, think of it that way. Um, they, if there's a way to get in, they will get in. Um, I think the reason we have what we have is because of this longstanding effort for green spaces and travel ways. And I think uh, supporting groups and agencies that continue that is just a wonderful thing. It's one of the things I love best about Tucson. And then finally, um, one problem that I didn't talk about in this, but we're gonna start gathering some data on is anticoagulant rodenticides are a huge problem for wildlife, not just bobcats, huge problem. If you just uh, Google rodenticides as in rodents, things that kill rodents and wildlife, you can spend a lot of time looking at it. It's a very complicated um, subject and it's a controversial one, but basically, you know, that moves up the food chain. So something like a bobcat that's catching rodents who are being poisoned, it's just an automatic uh, up the food chain. And most specifically, uh, if, you, if you have to use a rodenticide is use one that, um, don't use one that's what's called a second gen generation rodenticide and it'll be advertised like you know one bite and dead or one and done or something like that so in other words the rodent only has to feed on it once and he dies they're very very strong chemicals and both urban bobcat populations that have been followed long term have both had significant problems from rodenticides so that's a big one as far as i'm concerned and then, you know, if you just want to, in your own environment, um, I think everyone knows right now the water situation that we have. Probably 75% of the pictures that we get of bobcats are at water sources. So they're at people's uh, waters in their backyards. So that's a simple thing. 
um, that you can do if you want to attract them. If you don't, then, then you know, avoid some of those things. Great. Well, thank you. Those are those are good things for us to keep in mind to enhance uh, bobcat habitat. And there was a comment made that, wow, bobcats really are that natural rodent control. So if you're trying to get rid of bob, uh, rodents around your home, you probably just want to have your bobcats. <laughs> really, really your bobcat. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we've got some questions. We're at 1030. Understand that some people might need to jump off, but we're going to continue the Q&A for a few minutes. So are there any examples of hybridization between bobcat and house domesticated cats is a question that was raised. You know, that's a good question. And, and you hear, I, I'm constantly, people are constantly telling me about, and you'll hear this with dogs and coyotes as well, you know, constantly telling me about uh, this cat that was part bobcat and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's really rare, you know, truthfully in most cases, a bobcat is gonna eat a domestic cat if they can catch it, right? So they aren't gonna look at them uh, as a breeding partner. Now that said, in, in penned situations, um, some of you, uh, I think it's the Savannah cat, that's a quote domestic breed of cat that's actually a mixture. I believe it's a serval and a domestic cat. Uh, mixture. So it is possible. It's biologically possible. I don't think it happens very much um, in the wild. A lot of what people uh, think are bobcats, and we get these pictures, by the way, um, are Manx cats, which are a breed of cat that has a short tail. And so, um, yeah, I, I won't say it isn't possible, but I don't think it happens very often in the wild. Okay, great. Great. Um, so there was a little bit of surprise that bobcats would actually be going up onto flat roots, you know, that they would think that that was analogous to a rock pile. Um, do you have a sense of how frequently that's actually happening in the population you're watching? You ask about the roofs, how often the roofs, they go up? Yeah, flat roofs, yeah. you said, was, was yeah. something. I know, know, I know, and we and we thought that too. And, and we're, again, we're in the first year. So um, we did actually, uh, last week, we went out to four houses and of those houses two of them had definitely had the kittens on the roof to start with and then brought them down uh, into the backyards one of them she was still up on the roof with the kittens and in fact we went up on the roof to see if we could set up a camera and she growled at us so we gave her her roof back um, <laughs> she's got two trees that she goes up and down and she goes and hunts and one of the homeowners saw her take a rabbit up on the roof so um, I, I, I don't want to say it's common, but I suspect that as we continue to get the word out, um, it's not uncommon. I think that uh, the roof, um, either a roof or and or uh, a roof combined with a backyard that has a high wall, like a high black block wall, because um, she's going to be avoiding her predators that she's going to be avoiding are going to be dogs and coyotes. Um, which she's going to lump together, and other bobcats, because male bobcats that didn't father kittens, if they can find the den, they will catch and kill those kittens, because then she comes back in to Estrus as a breeding partner. So those are the two things that she's probably the most aware of. I don't think it has to do with where there's a lot of food, for instance, because what we see of our cats is they go tremendous distances away from the den site to hunt. So I think it has to do with her picking what she's comfortable with. And so far that's been roofs and one had them kind of back behind an air conditioner in a high walled uh, garden. I think that's the other thing is someplace with high walls. Interesting. Okay. okay. Thanks. So you're showing this amazing data where you're seeing the bobcats. And we think about this a lot with large cat conservation in terms of revealing the locations of the animals, mm -hmm. like, of course, jaguar and ocelot that are so imperiled. Um, do you have concerns about revealing the locations of these animals and specifically den sites? And how do you help protect those from people that might disturb the mothers? Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a good question. A couple of things. First of all, um, you know, everything you're seeing is in the past, so to speak. So you're not seeing live information um, with the exception of the den sites, which they are still there. Um, so 
the, our map person said this best, it's essentially a random location for her. So within that two or three square mile, the, on a schedule, the caller turns on, it's a two second transaction for it to take a location and then it turns right back off. So you can literally probably spend a year in her home range and never find her. Um, she's just, she's just, they move all the time. Um, the den sites, honestly, we went to all four with our radio equipment and we did not find any of them. And that was using the radio equipment to find her. It was, it was humiliating. Um, <laughs> they are so well hidden and she, we never saw her and um, you know, she's going back there. So we know the kittens are there. Uh, when I did the work in Ohio, it was the very same situation. They're very good at hiding them. They're very uh, good at avoiding people. And so um, we don't put the live data on the website. So in other words, you know, we don't do that. And um, we debated about the locations as far as the den sites and whatnot. But what we found out very quickly when we did try to go find the den site was that likely we have no locations of the actual den site. What we're getting is her coming and going because when she's in her den site, she's in rocks and the GPS turns on and tries to get a location and it can't get a location. So what we're seeing is this hillside where she's coming and going. Um, but that's a good question. I mean, I think it's about, we thought a lot about it and we continue to because the last thing we wanna do is uh, endanger someone for sure. Right. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's always that fine balance. We want to raise awareness so people truly understand they're part of the cat's habitat, but of course, protect the Absolutely. safety of the individuals. So thank you for, for explaining mm -hmm. how you approach that. Um, someone mentioned that they had tried to participate in the project from Oro Valley a few years ago, and that maybe that was outside of the range. So is there a geographic range where you're limiting participation with the survey or... I think that that was there was a previous effort to to contact people. They didn't have radioed cats, but they did contact people and ask them to send in information. Um, we pretty much take all of it. Uh, we we set some boundaries for ourselves. So, in other words, if we get out, say as far as Marana, um, at that point in time, you know, we're we're just for our own boundaries. Two of our kitten sites were in Vail that we went to last weekend. Actually, one of them was in Catalina. So, um, you know, send it in. We certainly will record it um, and appreciate the information. So yeah, by all means, send it in. Great, okay, wonderful. Okay, two more questions. Um, how much can you tell that female ranges are actually overlapping? Um, that just has to do with, so everyone's radioed at the same time, and we just look at, uh, we get at least two locations a day, and right now on our females, we're getting four locations a day. So if you just look at over time, you're going to have several hundred locations, and that overlap is less than 5%. And then if you look at the males, we probably have 70 or 80 percent overlap with the males, so that's how we sort that out. It's just a, it's just a sheer mapping issue. Um, mm -hmm. They, uh, they do a lot of marking. They know each other. Uh, it may well be that there are some relations, so there may be mother daughter that are next to each other. Uh, but by and large, those female home ranges are are pretty, um, pretty unique. The only place we've seen that break down a little bit is on the golf course. We know we had a female on the golf course, an adult female who had kittens there last summer. The female that we caught is a young female and she has her first litter of kittens now. And they seem to have more overlap. So hopefully we'll catch that female that this fall and we'll get some DNA and we'll be able to tell if that's a mother daughter situation where she's actually sharing a little bit of her um, home range with the daughter. Interesting. Well, that, if I heard you correctly, you're saying that the males really can share territories. That's they so do. different from the larger cats in the region, like mountain lion yeah. or jaguar that are so territorial and those males really disperse to find their own ranges. So interesting that bobcat yeah. is so, so different in that way. And, and, you know, the males, the males do not like each other. They fight with each other. They compete with the males, but 
for ever since the breeding season got over, we've had those three males in a couple square mile area. So they aren't hanging out together, but they also are, you know, obviously tolerating each other. And so it's, um, uh, and, and, you know, what happens with bobcats is that the males disperse, most of the males dis kittens disperse, some of the female kittens disperse, and some, if there's room, will try to fit in next to the mother or close by to the mother. Um, but those young males, and they'll keep dispersing until they find a place they can squeeze in. Um, but they definitely overlap. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have the time, just two more questions. So how about how much are the adult cats that you're measuring? How much do they weigh? Oh, yeah. Good question. I, I forgot to mention that. Well, they look way bigger than they are if you talk about weight. They don't carry any extra weight at all. But uh, our females were 12 to 16 pounds. And our males were 17 to 21 pounds. So everyone who's got this big fat house cat right now is thinking, oh my God, my house cat weighs more than a bobcat. I have a 16 right. pound house cat here. Right. So um, it's just, uh, you know, they're very tall. Uh, and like I said, right now they are so thin because especially the females feeding kittens, very, very thin. So right. they're lean and mean from that point. I'm sure. Yeah. They're walking and a I lot. Think Yes, they never stop moving. I don't think that uh, we would likely see more than about a 25 pound. We did have one of our males that was a young male that um, he, he's one of our mortalities. He got killed. He got shot, I think, getting someone's chickens, actually. Um, but he would have been a 25 pound male. He was a big cat. And he just, unfortunately, we didn't, weren't able to, to keep him alive. Okay. Oh, that's sad. Um, with a yeah. final question, can you comment a little bit about what you understand about the competition between bobcats and coyote, another predator that's really common in these urban landscapes? Yeah, I think, um, I think that they do interact. I think it, it kind of depends on who has the advantage. So if it's a situation where we've got a group of coyotes, um, I've seen bobcats run from the coyotes. I've seen bobcats run. I've also seen bobcats stay their ground uh, with a kill and chase coyotes away. So I think there's, you know, that balance point. They've they've been together for a really long time. I think where that becomes more important is uh, in her selection again for kittens that she's going to pick some place that coyotes can't get into. She's going to go up high or she can get in that walled um, garden uh, type of situation. But, you know, they certainly overlap. They certainly compete. Um, our coyote densities in urban areas are super high. And, um, you know, that is somewhat unusual situation, but it's getting more and more common everywhere in the United States, not just here. Uh, there's a lot of research that's been done on urban coyotes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for, the, Cheryl, for this. This is fascinating. I think we're going to be following Absolutely. the project with a lot of interest uh, in, the coming, in the coming months and hopefully years that the project can continue. So thank you for sharing Absolutely. this information with us. Um, Sky Island yeah. Alliance will be helping to share the results that come out of the project and we'll be spreading the news as we hear it from Cheryl and her colleagues. So keep watch for more insights into Bobcats in Tucson. Our Coffee Break series is gonna be taking a midsummer break for the next few weeks, but we'll be coming back at the end of July to talk about hopefully the monsoon season we hope is coming, up, coming to our region. We will be uh, chatting with the climate assessment for the Southwest, Climus, about climate science and the monsoon. So follow us on social media and our newsletter to watch for more information about that webinar. And you're just getting um, really wonderful accolades from people watching today. Cheryl, everyone's so appreciative for the research that you're doing and thank you for sharing it with all of us. It's a pleasure. I obviously love talking about it and I'm happy to come back. So I'm happy to come back uh, once the female kitten thing is over with and give everybody an update on what we are learning from our female system. And if you by all means, if you know someone, please have them go to our site and report a and kittens or 
uh, any Bobcat data. We really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the invite. Terrific. Well, we'd love to have you back. So thanks so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.